All right, so Nick Rhodes, thank you so much for coming on Chaplin Talk, sir. My pleasure. So, uh, you know, obviously I did some research into uh, Duran Duran's career. And I mean, you guys were like pioneers of the industry. I mean, you had a music video out before even MTV was around. It was around the same, it was around the same period. Our, I think our first video, yes, predated MTV. Um, but they, um, they, were, they were really... Uh, an incredible part of the 1980s music story. Uh, when, when we were first told there's this new cable channel in America and all they're gonna do is play music for 24 hours, but you get visuals with it, of course. We all just looked at each other and said, well, what's not to like? How, why didn't that happen before? Uh, we should all get that all the time because music being the biggest thing in our lives, it, great we can we can watch everybody else and of course it became a home for us to to do what we wanted and because they needed content um, everybody was uh, forthcoming with budgets to make videos that got more and more insane as the 80s moved on and um, MTV grew into the most fantastic channel until they started having game shows was a catastrophe, uh, maybe not financially, but uh, horrible for music. I wish they were still a proper music channel. And not only was your first video successful, I mean, your first album sold 2.5 million records and went to number three on the UK charts. I mean, it, it was a long time ago when people used to have, you know, vinyl. Actually, vinyl is coming back, though. I'm, I'm very happy about that. I still think it's the superior format. If you really want to listen to a proper experience that's closer to how it, those things sounded when you made them in the studio. The record is, is the closest thing. And how, I mean, what was the process for you guys writing songs? Well, how would it start normally? Well, it, it hasn't really changed much since, um, since we started. We, um, we all get in a room together mm -hmm. and we start playing things until we find something that gels a little bit. Hopefully we're all playing in the same key. That's always helpful. And um, at that point, we, we, we clutch hold of it and try to build it into a song. We write more now with the aid of computers because you record it straight into the computer so you can fiddle around with things rather than having to try and remember, well, what did we do five minutes ago? What do you think of the music industry nowadays? Because it's changed so much over the last 20 years. Um, I've never really been a great fan of the music industry. Uh, I think there's a lot of people there that haven't got a clue what they're doing. It seems to be the only industry in the world where you can be really bad at what you do and get promoted. Um, but having said that, of course, there's some amazing people too. And I think the few people we were able to find at different record labels, uh, particularly at EMI, where we spent a very long time, um, who helped and understood music, uh, were really special. There was a guy who signed us called Dave Ambrose, um, and I've never ever forgotten him. He still remains a friend of ours because he was a real music guy. Uh, firstly, he was a musician, but then moved into the, the other side of the music business, and he was fantastic to have around. He really encouraged us, and he knew what he was doing. I, I feel a lot of people look at the music industry now as just a product. It may as well be a box of breakfast cereal. And is it true that you, I mean, not only do you, you obviously help write songs and record the music, apparently you also like to um, get a little bit more involved into the, like the production and the mixing side of, of a record. Yeah, yeah I, I think if you're, if you're making something, um, you, you want to follow it through all the way. Uh, that's just the way I've always done things, even when I was a kid. I, I, yeah. I wanted to make sure that things were finished properly and until a record is mixed and actually even when it's it's it goes to be mastered uh, you, you've got to keep your eye on it and make sure that everything's right because um, it's all about the editing <laughs> yeah because the reason I bring this up is because the wedding album was mixed in Montreux in Switzerland it was yeah we've been to Montreux several times we played at the uh, the Montreux Jazz Festival. I think we played one year on the same bill as Prince, uh, which was fun. Okay. 
Because you know that's the area where my grandfather lived the last 25 years of his life. Um, he stopped along the way to Geneva and uh, fell in love with this house uh, after being kicked out of America. Yeah, well, that whole thing, I, you see, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, um, I read the autobiography, uh, Charlie Chaplin's autobiography, mm-hmm. uh, some years ago, and it, it was a fantastic read. Um, it, was, it was really wonderfully put together because it was from his point of view, but about the experiences and the stuff um, where after he pretty much invented Hollywood with a few friends there and had an extraordinary career there to then get forced out by uh, a sort of uh, McCarthyism. Um, it was kind of extraordinary, but I think he made the right decision. It was early 50s, right, when he, uh, yeah. he just decided to get out of there because they were treating him so badly. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary, really, when you, when you read what, and understand what these people were going through. A lot of people know the basics of the story, but I, I loved learning about the beginnings when he was uh, you know, he's in a workhouse in London and, and, uh, and then ended up being one of the first superstars in the world. It, it's, nice. it's, it, it's really, really something. But my favorite, one of my favorite things in the book, which I, I often um, uh, tell people, about is uh, the journey. So he, he, he'd been in Hollywood for a while and he's, he's invented the Tramp, uh, which uh, was such a, a, an incredible character that people loved. And he was making these short films and they were very popular and he knew that. He was starting to do quite well in Hollywood. And then one day when they ask him, say, well, they want you in New York. So we, we've got to get you to New York. We're going to put you on a train to go to New York. Yeah. The description of his journey from California to New York, it's really the birth of the first superstar of the world. For it me. really is, yeah. Um, because he gets on the train. He has no idea that these films are available all over the place and that people all over America have seen them because he's been making them but people have been sending them out and distributing them. So every town he gets to, the train has to stop, even when it's not supposed to stop there. And he gets, he has to go to the window and wave because they all want to see Charlie Chaplin. And it's just, it's just extraordinary. Of course, by the time he gets to New York, um, the whole thing is complete madness. But that description, it it was really, um, I think the earliest proper record of, of someone realizing they'd become a superstar. So and it's, it's so amazing, isn't it? When you think nowadays, you just do something on the internet and the, within hours it can go viral, you know? He'd been making these movies for a while and... Uh, and you yeah, but, that, no, but not knowing, it was, it was it, <laughs> just crazy. There was a lot of things in the book that I, I thought were, were fantastic though. Um, uh, the, uh, actually I was telling, um, uh, uh, a comedian here called Jimmy Carr, and we were having a conversation at a, an event a few years ago, and, and I told him the story of, um, about the director that comes up to Chaplin and says, uh, uh, how do you make slipping on a banana skin funny again, Charlie? And in the book, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but in the book, it's, uh, he basically says, well, you film it, and you film the guy walking towards the banana, and you film him, and you see the banana, and you think he's going to slip on the banana. He steps over the banana, but he falls down a manhole. And, um, and, 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 and Jimmy hadn't heard the story. He then went and told Stephen Fry the story, uh, who's another of our uh, great um, British comedy characters here. Um, and... Uh, Stephen was, rep, uh, was presenting the uh, British, um, the BAFTA Awards the next night, and he told the story on the BAFTAs. <laughs> and so I thought, well, you know, that's how things um, get uh, woven into the fabric of our, of our world, really, because uh, it, it's, it's such a great story anyway, but it, it was in the book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, his book is a great read. And that train journey that you're talking about as well, I mean, that was... I think it was around 1915 that happened and he was on his way to New York because uh, I think his brother, Sidney, was negotiating a, a new contract for him with Mutual Films. Right. 
And uh, so that's why he went over there. And when he got there, he found out he signed, he signed a, like a, a ridiculous deal. And, and that's he only went up from there. He was a real innovator, though, in, in, in many, many ways, uh, not just the films and the characters, but I, I think United Artists, people forget that he formed that with, with, with a couple of people in, in LA's friends uh, who were also very influential. But to actually put together a company to give artists the power over the other <coughs> business people that, that had really maintained it and, and were doing the land grab, it was... It was um, it was a brave and new way of looking at things. And the company survived very well for a long time. Eventually, it, it fell. But, but things like that, I, I, um, I think he really, he, he was never afraid of, of trying things out. Um, well, so many of the movies are really great. One of the ones I love that I, I think is really underrated, um, and a lot of people haven't even seen it now, is Monsieur Verdoux. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, if you, for anyone watching who hasn't seen it, go watch it. It's a, it's a real treat. My favorite scene, uh, and I don't know why, but I always go back to my childhood when I when I think of this. The scene where he is in the boat with this woman, and he's obviously trying to uh, trying to kill her, and he has chloroform, and he's trying to get the chloroform on her, and it falls on his face, and like it just all goes completely wrong. It's one of the funniest things ever, I gotta say. Can I speak? How careful you go overboard. Are you seasick? No. Shame on you, a man who's lived at sea all his life. Oh, Captain, really? His influence upon uh, the, the next generation of comedians, and it, it still ricochets on now, um, was, was really unlike anybody else. I mean, him and Buster Keaton, I guess, they really uh, set the mold for things and, and, and the standard. And, and there was a lot of sadness in it too, which I, I, th I think people forget. Um, that they're, really, um, they're really something, the movies. And, now it's much harder for people. People like to watch about a minute online at the most as a soundbite in bright colors from a, from a phone. Yeah. But, but then making those movies was such an effort and involved so many people and, and, and everything about them. He really, um, he, he, was a, he was a true pioneer. Um, and, and now I guess because the, the, the early ones were all silent, People pay a lot less attention, but but I was very happy that um, Attenborough made the the uh, movie Chaplin, yeah. and and I think Robert Downey was exceptional. He really, really should have won the Oscar for that. I, I don't know who won that year, but but if ever somebody was robbed, I, I, I think that that's the case because because he was um, he was magnificent in it actually. Yeah, he did a fantastic job. And, uh, you know, uh, Dustin Hoffman was originally considered to play him, to play my grandfather. And uh, they went, I, I think because he was younger, they went for Robert Downey Jr., you know. I think a great choice. It worked out well. Yeah. But, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, as, as time moves on, it's, it's very easy for generations to lose where everything came from. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I do really believe with Chaplin that, that he's so important in, in um, the development of cinema. It, um, it sort of begged belief that he got forced out of Hollywood in the 50s. But it was, it was a lovely moment when he went back in the early 70s to collect the, the sort of honorary Oscar. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he should have had shelves full of them. But, but, um, but at least he, he got to see 
uh, that recognition from the academy later. And I, thought, I, I remember seeing the footage, um, and it was very touching. My father always said that uh, when, it, when he originally got the invitation, he was still sort of very angry and did not want to go. He was like, you know, I'm not going to do this. He didn't want any part of it. And it was his wife, my grandmother, Una, that uh, convinced him. She said, you should go back, you know, it would be nice. And eventually he went back. And when he got there, he saw all his friends, they, all his friends turned up, you know, and he was completely overwhelmed, apparently. And after everything happened and he came back to Switzerland, apparently he was just so much more at ease, at, at peace with himself. Yeah, I can understand that because it was so um, brutal, the, the, the uh, sort of exit that he had to make and, and, and what had happened. I, um, I can really imagine his uh, frustration and anger with the, how, how he'd been treated. And, uh, I'm glad he went back, though. I, I, was, I was happy to see it. So, uh, Nick Rhodes, thank you so much for coming on, huh? It's my pleasure, my pleasure. I'll, I'll leave you with one thought, is that um, uh, your grandfather was responsible for introducing me to a word that I had never, ever seen or heard of before. Okay. When I was reading um, his autobiography, I came across this sentence that had the word propinquity in it. And I thought, what on earth does that mean? And then later in the book, he used it again. So it's the only book I've ever read that has the word pro propinquity in it at least twice, if not more times. So, so I'm very grateful to him for that. <laughs> uh, what does it mean? It's, a, it's to do with being a, a closeness to, uh, to, oh. to people or to a relation or uh, a proximity to things. But, uh, but oh. yeah. Oh, yeah. In popular term at the time, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> No, thank you so, so much, Nick. It, it has been an absolute pr uh, pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. Good to chat to you. Okay, bye. thank you very much. Huh? Okay. Bye. Uh, bye, bye, bye.